first annual uh, Brosman Foundation and Ronald E. Frisbee uh, Science Lectureship. And tonight we have the pleasure of hosting uh, Ms. Uh, Christine McKinley, uh, mechanical engineer, musician, author, and entrepreneur. So uh, allow me to go ahead and introduce everyone on stage here tonight. And I'll start on, on the way down here. So first we have Mr. Barry Miller, Senior Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of the Ephrata National Bank, representing the Mr. and Mrs. William F. Brossman Charitable Foundation. Next, we have uh, Millersville, Millersville University's uh, Jeff Adams, Associate Provost, um, and also by training, a physicist. Okay. Um, next, we have Mr. Ron Frisbee Jr., who's uh, one, one, uh, also uh, a Millersville University employee. He works over in uh, the uh, project manager, okay, over in facilities and financial administration. And uh, he's here on behalf of his father, uh, Ron Frisbee uh, Sr. And Ron is actually a, uh, a representative of the Brosman Foundation, as well as the, a founding committee member uh, on the science lectureship. So he was integral in getting this program started from the beginning. And so, uh, Ron, you know, we're, we're very sorry that, that your father couldn't be here this evening, uh, but we'd like to make sure, please convey our gratitude for him, for his support of this program, and for, uh, we hope to see both, both of you back here next year for the 32nd, okay? Next, we have our speaker tonight, Ms. Mc, uh, Christine McKinley, and we have uh, William Kaufman, who is a uh, physics major here at Millersville University. And so the, the annual Brosman Frisbee Science Lecture and Competition is just one of several uh, Millersville University initiatives intended to stimulate interest in the mathematics, science, and technology programs among bright, young students in our region. So our college sponsors a variety of different events. One of them, for example, is the Summer Science Training Program. It's a three-week program that we have here uh, where students anywhere between 8th and 11th grades come in and they do a variety of science, uh, math, and technology workshops that are basically uh, facilitated by university faculty. And that's held in uh, every July and this year will be our 30th year for doing that program. Uh, next we have our annual Women in Mathematics and Science program and we're up to our 29th year where we're doing that program. The next program when, that, when that's going to be held is April 5th and that, that program is designed to go ahead and provide career advice uh, for young women as they go ahead and, and start looking into what, what's available for me um, in the fields of science and technology. Our longest running program is the high school mathematics contest which brings math, uh, you know, future mathematicians interested in, in, in doing a mathematical competition from uh, the, the surrounding region to our campus to go ahead and, and compete and uh, interact with our mathematics faculty. And for the ninth straight year, uh, Millersville University will be hosting uh, the Central Pennsylvania Science Olympiad. And that'll be on uh, March 19th. And then finally, uh, they, we have a Spotlight on Science program, whereby faculty uh, at the university here will go out to area elementary and middle schools and, and secondary schools to go ahead and talk about science, some of the research that they're doing, some of the topics that they're interested in, to go ahead and help engage students and get them in, uh, have them see what interest there is, what, what type of activities there are that scientists go ahead and do, and maybe kind of get some ideas going as to what they can do in order to go ahead and be a future scientist or engineer. And so I'd like to go ahead then and just uh, start out by just thanking the, the numerous people who, who went ahead and to help make this night possible. And so first I'd like to go ahead and just thank the mem members of the Science Lectureship Committee. And so for all of those uh, individuals who are here this evening, could you please stand? And I'd like to give them a big round of applause. Thank you. I'd also like to go and give a very special thank you uh, to the faculty who went ahead and did the uh, science uh, demonstrations this afternoon as well as the, the faculty who helped kind of coordinate the exam and, and actually had it to, to go through and grade it. <laughs> so I really want to thank them for that. As well as three people in my office who without them, I don't know what I would do in order to go ahead and not even run this program, but run anything in the, in the, in the office. 
and they are Mrs. Susan Thomas, Miss uh, uh, Marine France, and Ms. Uh, Amanda Copel. And so I'd like to go ahead and give them a big round of applause as well. So. Okay, so this program is made possible through the generous support of the Mr. and Mrs. William F. Brossman Charitable Foundation. The Brossman Foundation was established in the memory of Mr. and Mrs. William F. Brossman, who in 1911 founded the Denver and Ephrata Telephone and Telegraph Company. The university wishes to acknowledge the late Mrs. Emily B. Sprecher, Millersville University graduate, class of 1926, and the late Mrs. Um, Ann B. Swigert, the daughters of Mr. and Mrs. William F. Brosman, for their support of this program. And we also wish to thank uh, Mrs. Bertha Brosman Blair, another Millersville University graduate, class of 1912, the founder of the Brosman Foundation, and the trustee uh, board uh, of the uh, Brosman Foundation. So now I'd like to go ahead and invite Mr. Uh, Barry Miller here, uh, who's graciously agreed to go ahead and give a few remarks on behalf of the Brosman Foundation. So please come on up. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. And good evening, everyone. It's certainly a privilege to be w with you here this evening. And it is uh, um, a particular pleasure for us at the Effort of National Bank to be the trustees and the administrator of the William and Jemima Brosman Charitable Foundation, uh, which, which we have been uh, since the foundation was formed 31 years ago. Uh, the Brosman Foundation was established, um, as you heard, by the late Bertha Brosman Blair to honor her mother and father who founded the Denver and Ephrata Telephone and Telegraph Company in 1911. Her father was a successful fertilizer salesman who resided on a farm, uh, the Sunnyside Farm, in Brecknock Township. He enjoyed the use of, modern of the modern phone system at that time, but he often had difficulty in reaching farmers in the evening as the phone company's operators didn't work farm-like hours. You, uh, some of you won't know this, but back at that time, uh, operators had to connect telephone calls. And if you ever saw pictures of people plugging things into big electronic boards to make those connections, that, that was the operators. And there was a time they didn't work in the evening, so Mr. Brosman, who tr wanted to get in touch with his farmers in the evening when they were uh, more likely to be reached and not in their fields, uh, was frustrated uh, by that. So, uh, seeing a need, he decided to form his own telephone company, uh, which was based on hard work and unrivaled service to customers. He learned quickly he had no experience in running a telephone company, and in 1913, he asked his oldest daughter, Bertha, to quit her teaching job and come to work at his telephone company. Bertha had graduated from the Millersville Normal School in, in 1912, as we heard. She loved teaching, um, and she told her father that she would work for him for only one year. Well, she enjoyed the phone company work and experience so much, she stayed for the next 73 years, uh, until her death in 1985 at the age of 93. After Bertha's death, her family decided that the effort of National Bank would be the trustee of a charitable foundation as we were the banks um, that the Brosmans had turned to in 1911 to start the D&E Telephone Company. The Brosman Foundation was formed to provide in per perpetuity scholarships for deserving boys and girls graduating from high school and living within uh, the boundaries of the service area for the telephone service provided by D&E. In addition, the foundation uh, also has resources that helps funds the enterprise of scholarship by supporting such efforts as uh, capital needs on local colleges, university campuses, uh, as well as programs like the science lectureship we're experiencing tonight. So it is again a pleasure and a privilege for me to be here at Millersville, my alma mater. And on behalf of the effort of National Bank and the William and Jemima Brosman Foundation, we're so very pleased that Dr. McKinley has agreed to share her experience with us this evening. Thank you. So now this afternoon, we had some really bright high school students here doing a competition. 23 schools in all 
competed in teams of two, okay, uh, written by an exam that was, that was challenging, okay. Uh, our science and, and mathematics faculty went ahead and put a nice one together for us. And uh, it was a great day for competition. And can I ask all of the high school students who sat for the exam and who are still here to please rise along with their teachers, please. That's great. So again, two, two students from every high school worked as a team on the examination. Um, each, each member of the winning teams will receive a gift a certificate to Barnes & Noble. Um, assisting in the presentation of the awards tonight will be uh, Dr. Adams, Mr. Miller, Ms. McKinley, uh, Mr. Frisbee, and Mr. Kaufman. And so I ask that the student award winners remain on stage until the top three teams have received their awards. And then what we'll do is, is we'll go off into the atrium uh, to take photos, okay? So the third place team, uh, I do not believe is going to be here this evening. I, I had some conversations with a, a few teams earlier. Uh, but if they are, that's great. But if... Uh, just to be prepared. So the third place winner is goes to Jacob Halbert and Brian Liu from Central Dolphin High School. The second place award goes to Madison Brown uh, and James Liu from Lancaster Count, uh, Country Day School. And now the first place. First place goes to Samika Conacher and Erica Wang from Hershey High School. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the students, along with Dr. Adams and Mr. Miller and Mr. Frisbee, to go ahead and join me um, in the atrium to go ahead for photographs. And uh, now I'll go ahead and introduce uh, William Kaufman, who will go ahead and, and uh, have an introduction for our speaker. So thank you. Welcome, all, and thank you for coming to Christine McKinley's presentation for the 31st Annual Brosman Frisbee Science Lectureship. Christine McKinley is a STEM activist, mechanical engineer, author, and rock star. <laughs> she graduated from the California Polytech State University in San Luis Obispo with a bat bachelor's in mechanical engineering and has spent most of her engineering career designing and managing construction of places such as power plants, semiconductor facilities, hospitals, and schools. She has also co-hosted for programs such as Under New York for the Discovery Channel and Brad Meltzer's Decoded for the History Channel. Her musical, Gracing the Atom, won a Portland Drammy for original score, and her book, Physics for Rock Stars was published on November 2014. Now presenting to you, 
how science can make you more decisive, courageous, and glamorous. Ladies and gentlemen, Christine McKinley. Thank you. Um, one of the presenters called me Dr. McKinley, and I just want to say that I prefer that from now on. Dr. McKinley, I only have a four-year degree, but I'm just going to go with it. So um, congratulations, all of you that came here and took that exam, just to even be, be the people that were chosen to come from your school and take that exam is a pretty big deal. So good for you for, for getting through it. Um, and I'm really glad that you're focused on science and that you understand the usefulness of science because I've become um, convinced, not only in writing this book, this is on the cover of the book, is it? No, it's not. It was supposed to be on the cover of the book. We have a different one on the cover of the book. Um, not only in writing this book, but before writing the book, I had this feeling that everybody needs to understand at least the basic laws of physics, the basic laws of motion and energy because they will make you more decisive, more courageous, more glamorous, and keep you from being a sucker. I truly believe that. And also, uh, the laws of physics and, and a little bit of chemistry has helped me come up with some really useful models for my life um, that have worked for me, to, like models for dating and managing chaos and staying mostly out of jail, for the most part. <clears throat> Some of this I learned in jail, but it's a, it's a you'll, you'll, you'll understand later. It was just a misunderstanding. <laughs> so I think that um, I'm, I'm, I'm very sure that um, studying physics and studying science makes you more decisive um, because we get used to, even just as a student, a high school student of physics and, and algebra and chemistry, you get used to thinking in a certain way. So what is the first thing that you do if you're given a problem and you, you don't know um, exactly how to tackle it. Say it's a physics problem. What are the two things you define? Knowns and unknowns. Another way is constraints and variables. Things you know, things you're sure of, and things you're not sure of. So if you were um, solving a physics problem about a cannonball, you might be given the mass of the cannonball, and um, you know what gravity is fixed, and you know there's just certain things you can't mess with, so you don't really bother fussing with them. You just start playing with the angle of the cannon and how much, how much explosive you're gonna put in it, and you solve the problem. But very quickly, you say, this is what I can mess with, this is what I can't mess with. And I believe that that kind of thinking makes you more decisive in your actual personal life. Like an example of constraints and variables or things you can change and things you can't are your family and your friends, right? So you might think you're hilarious, but no one in your family laughs at your jokes. That's the situation I was in. So I just, you can find variables or friends. You can find friends who think you are really funny. You'll never be able to change who your, who your parents are, but you can find the friends who really suit you. And I think that people that are used to thinking scientifically don't fret about the things they can't change and they go on to th change the things that they can. And, and I don't mean like, oh, I just am not a good cook. Because that's something you can influence by practice. But I mean the things you really can't change, like your height. Although I just wear high heels. Because I want to be even taller than five foot eight. So that's how I think, I, I truly believe, because I see, I work with engineers and I've become friends with engineers and they're a weird pack, but they are very decisive. They, they do not fret about things that they can't change, which is, you can't say that about everybody. Okay, so that's how it makes you more decisive. I also believe um, that being a scientist and being, even just studying it in high school and college makes you more courageous because we have learned, we have really mastered the art of partial credit. <laughs> you are surviving on partial credit a, a good portion of your student life. I know this. Um, so who's taking, who's taking like chemistry, physics, algebra, geometry, any of those sort of partial credit kind of, okay. So you know the trick is, and I, this is how I got through thermodynamics and fluids in college. The trick is if you have five questions on an exam 
and you get them and you, you quickly sort of fly through it and you realize, wow, I don't know how to solve any single one of these. You know you can maybe still get a C or a B on that exam, right? You just have to start writing something. Write your knowns, write your unknowns. If it's a big, hairy thermodynamics problem, I learned to just write, well, pressure is zero because it's in a big pool. So I know that temperature must be at least 212 here because it's boiling. You know, there's just certain things that you can find all your knowns and then a picture actually starts to come together and you get used to solving things while you're in motion. You get used to going, well, I'm just gonna start because I have to or else I'm turning in a whole bunch of blank pieces of paper and I'll fail the exam. I'll just start and then I'll figure things out along the way. And I think that that meant, like I've become friends with so many architects and engineers and science folks that I went to school with and we ended up doing a lot of crazy stuff right after graduation, grad, graduating from college and I think it was because we were just used to starting things that we didn't know how to finish. My friend and I ended up going over to London and figuring, well, we know the language. Like, it wasn't really legal for us to get jobs. We didn't really have resumes or, or skills that applied to anything, but we managed to find jobs waiting tables by just saying we've done it before. So I guess I'm telling you to lie. No, we just, we just learned to just start something, and then we found ourselves riding our bikes in Israel and going through the West Bank, and maybe some of those decisions were questionable, but we learned to just start with what we knew, and then if we got in trouble, just reel it back a little bit. So I believe for, from the outside, that looks like courage. It looks like bravery, but really what you've learned to do is just begin even when you're not sure how to finish it. And that's, as an engineer, that's how I design all the time. You'll, you'll get a big, if you become an engineer, you'll get a, a big problem that you have to solve and there's just no way you can get your arms all the way around it. So you just start with what you do know and you may have to you know, the iterative, iterative process. You may have to change a few things, see how that works, change a few other things, and see how that works. With really basic stuff, like where do we put this big giant tank? You know, just basic spatial problems sometimes. Start with what you know. That's, that's how scientists look brave. And then, and here's, here's how I think science, physics, chemistry, calculus, even algebra and geometry um, makes you more glamorous. Now, this, is a, this is a tough one, but I, I believe there are several ways it makes you more glamorous. One is you just know how to do stuff, like, well, there's that stage dive, but there's also a microphone throw. If you've never done a microphone throw in midair before and you're not a physicist, you could be in big trouble because you might think, well, I'm going to fall faster than the microphone, so I better get my hand in position ready to catch the microphone. Oh, no, no, no. If you've been taking physics, you know that that microphone is going to fall exactly, is going to accelerate at the same, the same rate as your body, right? So you're going to be able to execute that much better. Or at least think you can. You're going to at least, at least kind of think like, I know how things work, so I'm going to give this a try. Would you try that? I actually did. When I was writing the book, I was writing about microphone throws, and I thought, God, is this right? Would I really just throw it straight across? If I was standing, I'd make a little bit of, a little bit of, uh, I'd account for that drop a little bit. But if I'm, so I got on the back of my couch and took one of my microphones and unplugged it and started throwing it back and forth and it worked for the, for the most part. And then I <laughs> threw a really expensive microphone across the room. Not because I don't know physics, I just missed that one time. And also if you're going to be, if you, if you wanna be maybe uh, a secret agent, like I tried to think in the book of the most glamorous things you could be, like the sexiest things you could be, like rock star, secret agent, and why you would need to know physics. And for secret agent, it was so easy because we all know from the movies that if you're gonna be a secret agent, within like, I'm gonna say outside, inside of a week, you're gonna be in a fist fight on top of a moving train. <laughs> Absolutely is going to happen. We know this from everything we've seen about secret agents on TV and movies. So if you were in some kind of this fight, 
I'm gonna go ahead and say you're gonna use your kickboxing skills too. On a moving train, what's one of the first things you would wanna do? I'm so curious to see what you guys will answer. What's that? Duck at the bridges. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And you, how will you know they're coming? Be facing the right way. Right. So if you're in a fist fight on a moving train, you want to see what's coming up. And if you understand the laws of motion and you're, say, you're fighting away, doing your thing, every now and then you get a nice round high kick into the face because you're that good. Um, you're going to want to notice when the train starts turning, right? So say this train starts turning left and Mr. Bad Guy has got his back to the train and doesn't know it. What's his mass want to keep doing? Going in the same dang direction, right? So it's not going to take a lot for you to tip him off in the direction the train is not going to be. If you try and kick him the other direction, you're the one going off the train. So if you understand the laws of motion and can just do the simplest thing like, I'm going to go ahead and face forward in this fight and get yourself in position, you actually don't have to be the strongest, toughest, most badassest guy in the fight. You just have to be the smartest. Do you believe me? <laughs> so those, I mean, there are just certain sort of glamorous things like running in high heels that there is so much physics involved and you don't need to stop and do a free body diagram of your foot but you could you know in mid stride go you know it's probably going to be better if I land on the balls of my feet right now rather than my heels because that's where all the mass is being supported and if you're constantly thinking of stuff like that that I do think that gives you more confidence in how you operate in the world and confidence confidence is the sexiest thing that's what makes you glamorous, I believe, is just having a sense of how the world works. And can we just decide um, while we're here <laughs> that the cutoff age of, of childlike wonder is like 15? Let's just say we can be done with it. And then We can visit childlike wonder, that slack-jawed, beautiful childlike wonder. But are right around where maybe the youngest folks in the room are, it's time to get a hold of reality. It's time to really understand as much as possible how the world works and inhabit it like a grown-up. Are you taking that challenge? Committed to that? Because I know, I mean, I know adults, I'm 50, and I know adults my age who say, well, it's better just to like live in the magic. I, I don't know. I don't really know if it is better to live in the magic. I think it's better to walk around with some understanding of how things work and be able to analyze it, even if it's, even silly stuff, I think, builds your confidence. Like, do you remember this guy? Archimedes, right. And, and why this is so important, besides the fact that he's, he looks in, in the drawing that my illustrator made, really buff. Like, Archimedes seriously works out. He's like a UFC fighter in my version of Archimedes. But he got in the bathtub and he had that eureka moment because he felt buoyant, he felt light, and he realized that the water, the mass of the water was sort of fighting to get back in the space and that was providing a force that was pushing up. Physics teachers, how am I doing? Close enough, right? Um, understanding that helps you understand this. And if you just happen to be at a bar looking at your drink and everyone around you is being really boring and filled with childlike wonder, you know why this happens, right? You know that ice is less dense than water and it gets pushed up kind of like Archimedes. Well, Archimedes would be the olive in this case. But those little things, like just seeing someone ride a bike or seeing ice float in a drink while an olive or a cherry drops, just understanding weather understanding what happens, why, the, why your tires um, on your bicycle seem really puffed up in the heat and kind of shrunken down in the cold, that can make you a more confident person. It worked for me. And that's, I, I think that is the, the most glamorous thing someone ha can have, not necessarily um, clothes or a runway walk, but just a sense of themselves and a sense of how they fit in the world.
It looks good on everyone, confidence does. Do you guys know what that is? Red shift and blue shift? So the other thing that, that being at least somewhat of a scientist helps you do is it prevents you from being a sucker. It prevents you from being taken advantage of. And I, when I worked on Decoded on that TV show, I interviewed so many people who had no clue about just the basics, about the basics of how the world were and the basics of astronomy, and they were really worried about certain things happening that, you know, in 2012, that were not going to happen. And their, their thought process, process behind it was just so very odd. And this is, what, this is what prevents you from being a sucker, is just being literate at all. So why do we think, why do we teach people to read at all, even when they're in second grade? Why do we get them to start reading? Because we want them to, we want them to be, become adults at some point. We want them to be able to teach themselves. We want them to be able to be aware of what's going on around them. And if I was, if I decided to sort of take over this group right now, I couldn't, you're all too smart. If I decided to take over a group of people right now that is not you, why would I want them to not learn to read? I, I want to, yeah, I want to own them. I don't want them to know about anything else going on in the world. I want to create their whole reality for them. I want to say to them, when you see uh, red stars in the sky, those are angry gods, and I'm going to tell them to come hurt you if you're not good. Or if you see blue stars in the skies, those are sweet angels, and I can command them to give you gifts. Well, if you understand red shift and blue shift, that is not going to fly. What if I... Even better, what if I could predict an eclipse and nobody else in this tribe that I'm trying to take over could predict it? I'm going to look like a pretty smart person when that eclipse comes. I'm going to look like I know how to control the sun and the moon. And, and the people that I'm controlling will have no idea. They're going to start giving me a lot of grain tax. And they won't know to rebel because they won't be reading about the next village over that stormed the castle and killed their ruler, which would be really awkward for me. So being not only literate, but scientifically literate grows you from being gullible to being the person that actually reads the paper or, or understands concepts or understands fears in a way that is analytical. So instead of just being fed information, you're always analyzing information. Like, is that really right? Does that, does that make sense? Does it make sense that, that this specific race of people is better at this thing than this other race of people. Well, hmm, let's think about it. Let's, you know, what do the brains look like when they're dissected? Exactly the same. Hmm. It, it enables you to be, to sort of outsmart anyone who's trying to control you. Which sounds very combative. I don't mean it like that. I mean it in an empowering way. And it was painful, really painful when I was working on Decoded to, when they would say, <laughs> You know, it would be me and Buddy and Scott, and we're going to go interview an expert on the Mayan calendar. I'm like, okay, great, we're going to talk to an expert. This is finally, we're going to talk to a qualified archaeologist, and he's going to tell us why the, the calendar stopped. And they would, uh, they would give us someone who was an expert because he had a website, and the website said, you better buy these generators I'm selling because the world's going to end in 2012 because all the planets are lining up. And he just... Uh, it, uh, we had a guy say on camera that the magnetic poles of the planet would switch from nor north, south, south, north, which, which could happen. I think it happened some bazillion years ago, whatever. Wouldn't, wouldn't be the worst thing. But he said, if that happens, we'll all fall off the earth. <laughs> yeah, this is not to scale, but I wanted to explain to him... <laughs> The only way we're going to fall off the earth is if the earth's mass decreases so much that it no longer pulls me to it. And if that happens, we're going to have some turf wars that are going to be a lot bigger problem than us losing some gravity. I had to, most embarrassing of all, I had to explain that to an ex-boyfriend. Someone I dated for quite a while and I did not realize that he was, he was so cute that it was hard for me to see that he was not clever. And... <laughs> 
he called in real distress, really, and said, no, I know you're doing this show. I know you're doing this research. I'm packing up the car. I'm going to try and head to high ground because I know something's going to happen. This was right before December 21st, 2012. And I had to, I, God, I know, it's so embarrassing. So I had to, um, you know, have the compassion of my heart, uh, just sort of talk him down, tell him he didn't have to pack up the car, that I could promise on my life that, that gravity wasn't going to give up on December 21st, 2012. But it was on me that I had dated him that long. I had to own that. Mm. And the, the troubling thing about this is that then we waste our, our mental energy on, on things that aren't going to happen and we don't address the things that are real. And the things that are real for me, like the real issues for the future scientists and engineers are how is it that we're so dependent on electricity and yet our grid is so vulnerable? You know, that's really scary to me. A 48-hour, anything beyond that 48-hour power outage, people start to misbehave pretty badly. They don't really share their food and water. You know, everyone gets sort of scary and ugly at that point. So how are we spending time thinking about falling off the planet when, when we really haven't figured out how to take care of ourselves if the things we depend on go wrong? And I want, I personally, I live in a lovely neighborhood. I have really sweet neighbors. I'm almost positive they won't turn on me. Except one. There's one who would turn on me, like, tomorrow for any reason. But um, I don't want to be the person, the only person who, who's kind of thinking, like, okay, what do we do? Power's been out. What do we do for food? I could, if I absolutely had to, I could probably take a hanger, and you probably could too. Probably everyone in this room could take a couple magnets, a stationary bike, an old hanger, and, and figure out how to make a little generator. Yeah, maybe? If you had to, yeah. The problem is, if you're the only one who knows on your block who knows how to make a generator and some crude, maybe steam-fired weapons, and knows how to <laughs> purify water and... Um, then you're going to be like the lord of Southeast 32nd, the, the warlord of Southeast 32nd and Poplar. You know, that is going to be your territory now, and things are going to get very basic. And I don't know about you, but that kind of power would corrupt me in 20 minutes. I, I wouldn't be able to handle I would be addressing old grievances. You know, that guy across the street doesn't like me. He'd be digging all the latrine the trenches. It would be... It would be ugly. So I would rather have a scientifically literate populace so that I didn't turn in to the crazy bully warlord if there's a real power outage. Wouldn't it be nice if we were all somewhat capable? So someone over here is purifying water, someone's making a generator, someone's figuring out how to grow food in some way that I don't understand. That would be a much, much better scenario. You have to forgive me, because I grew up in Alaska, and so we think like this all the time, that always the Russians are just about to set foot on our backyard, and, and there are lots of power outages, so we're always ready for them. Okay, so that's how I believe studying science, being a science, scientist makes you more decisive, courageous, and glamorous, and keeps you from being a sucker. I would now like to share with you, it just gets weird from here, I'm just gonna warn you, my working models of the world based on what I know of chemistry and physics. And, and I have to say, um, you can't argue with results. I've done really well. So you can call me crazy, but then um, these have kind of worked for me in strange ways. Okay, so my working models are for dating, for managing chaos, and for staying almost entirely out of jail. So dating first of all, and this is laughable that I would be giving anyone dating advice, but um, from a single 50-year-old woman. Um, I went to a, a Catholic girls' school, and in order to take chemistry and physics, you needed to go across the street uh, to the boys' school. So I immediately signed up for all of those classes. <laughs> we walked over there like in a pack of plaid skirts, like a pack of caribou on the tundra, <laughs> the weakest in the middle the strongest on front and back, and then kind of shuffled into the class, and we all sat on row, in rows together, 
in the window. And then the boys kind of shuffled in and they all sat in rows by the door and no one looked at each other. Very complex mating situation in Catholic school. And then the teacher came in and said, oh, no, 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 no. We're going to, the junior prom is in three months. How are you ever going to find a date if you don't talk to each other? Just mortifying. And he sat us, girl, boy, girl, boy, so that we had to be each other's lab partners and so that we had to mingle and talk to each other, which seemed to me just cruel and weird and kind of like a cult wedding. Wasn't into it. No one was into it. Because one of the first rules of junior prom is your chemistry teacher doesn't get involved at all in any way. So he clearly had not read the manual. Um, but anyway, we've gotten our little, gotten our little groups, and he started teaching us about the periodic table and about um, bonding. And like a couple weeks into it, I thought, okay, he can be forgiven. He's not a complete weirdo. It's just that he's obsessed with bonding. That's all he thinks about. That's all the periodic table is about. And so, of course, he's going to want to try and make little junior, junior prom dates. And this is, how, this is basically how the periodic table looked to me. You've got the kind of, well, here, I'll explain it in terms of a covalent bond. I think it's the, so hydrogen is over there, way over there, and she has an electron to share, right? <laughs> please, please tell me if I get any of this wrong. Chlorine over here um, needs an electron. It's one electron short of a full outer ring, right? So chlorine drives this Camaro across here, shows up on hydrogen's porch, and they embrace, and they share an electron in their outer ring, and it's a, it's a pretty lovely moment. Pretty simple, pretty sweet. Then it gets weird. Um, then <laughs> sodium, over there, same situation, has an electron to share, right? Do I have that backwards? Okay. Sodium, but sodium's not patient. Sodium sneaks over in the middle of the night, gets catcalled by the base metals there. I don't show the, the boys on here, just the girl um, atoms, but there are boys in there. Um, and then, and just sort of throws herself at chlorine. And he just takes that electron. Doesn't even share it, just takes it. And that's, uh, and, and they're really not sharing an electron. It's more like they're just attracted to each other because they're now negatively and positively charged. It's not like covalent bonding. It's not sweet. It's kind of, I, I disapprove, personally. I just, <laughs> I, I would worry. If I were their parents or their friends, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like what I was seeing. And it only gets, um, it only gets worse from there. Uh, with H2O and benzene ring and all that, but I always pictured myself as um, kind of a noble gas, and I didn't know that in high school, but now I know because I had a uh, lab partner who I thought was just really adorable, Patrick. Um, uh, but Patrick, and I, I was pretty sure like, okay, this is gonna happen. He's gonna ask me to the junior prom. We were both on track, to, you know, track meets together and saw each other all the time in class and talked and, um, and he did not ask me to the junior prom. And now I know, I've actually spoken to him as an adult, and he was like, oh my God, yes, I had the biggest crush on you. But the problem is, I'm helium over here, I'm a noble gas, and I didn't know at the time, I've since learned, that in order to get someone to ask you out, you might actually have to smile at them, <laughs> engage them in some way. Luckily though, since I am a noble gas, I don't really need anything else. Like, I'm perfectly happy on my own. Maybe just visiting Krypton now and then, but otherwise, I'm good. So I really think that understanding the periodic table later in life, when I really got my head around it and sort of started joking about, like, well, I'm a noble gas, and I was like, you know what? It's okay to be whatever that is. It's okay to not be, like, a brunch-loving carbon it, because <laughs> wedding shower loving oxygen, because there is a thing in nature that doesn't bond really readily with other things. It exists, and I think that knowing what you are, and you could, you could find your model somewhere else. Maybe you study birds and you know that you are this particular kind of species, and that works for you as a model. But for me, this model really works. And when I meet people, I can kind of tell what they are. I can kind of tell if they're like, sloppy, needy lithium, or, or silver, or the kind of, or like over there magnesium who kind of like marries up. Like I can just sort of, I start seeing people as, 
as what they are. And I notice that my, the people I fit best with are other noble gases. You don't need me a lot, I don't need them a lot, and we just have a common understanding. That's how I think of dating. <clears throat> Let's talk about chaos, shall we? So uh, in physics, uh, uh, a picture much like this was up on the wall in physics class in high school. And I remember just being fascinated that here was this man who really got into the deepest, uh, deepest questions of the universe, the nature of space and time and its relation to one another. Um, and yet he did not know how to use a comb <laughs> at all. Didn't even know where to find his comb. That was fascinating to me that you could be that good at something and then have this much of a mess somewhere else. And then I, um, after learning first law of thermodynamics, learned second law. Do we know what first law is? Energy is neither created nor destroyed. And the second law is um, when it converts, it does so in a sort of messy way that's irreversible. And I thought, oh God, that's, so that means that everything is just getting messier and messier, and if my life is a control volume, then it inevitably gets more disordered. And, and that was a little scary to me, and then I thought, well, I'll just think about where to put the disorder. I'll just decide, and it's changed through the years. Um, my, you know, used to be my apartment. Now, now my house is really clean. Um, it, was, it was my dating life for a little while. Um, it, my hair, or whatever, but now it is my car. Like the passenger side of my car is where I throw a lot of interesting trash and then just leave it there because that's the one place that chaos lives in my life. Like my career is awesome, my health, my friends, my house, but that I just need to have one place where I just go, yep, that's the spot, that's where entropy lives. And I actually tried, after deciding this, I actually tried to clean it up one day, because a friend was coming, and she really disapproves of my car. So I got it all cleaned up, and something really bad happened at work. Like, a, a contract completely went south that wasn't supposed to. It was a big miscommunication, and I thought, I'm never doing that again. That is where entropy lives in my life. And then, this guy made perfect sense. Because he's trying to order a whole universe. He's trying to, in his head... And so he let one thing go that didn't matter at all. He let entropy live in his hair. It's kind of genius. Okay. My last model for a working life um, based on physics is how to stay out of jail. So I was um, working with Decoded. Um, and I was with a camera crew, and we decided we were going to go get to the bottom of Bohemian Grove. It's this um, sort of men's club in California, and it's on this, in this large wooded area. And one day we tried to get in the front with camera crew and everything, and the security guard said, nope, you can't get in here. So we thought it would be best to get some canoes and kayaks and go up through the Russian River and, and go that way because we'd been told not to go in, we were just gonna go in another way. That's probably more the stay out of jail thing right there. I could stop the story. <laughs> so um, I got arrested uh, and another guy on the crew got arrested. We were um, in jail for nine hours and I had never been in jail. It was fascinating. It's a fascinating ecosystem in there. Just a whole different group of people. I knew enough from sort of TV and movies to try and act tough. But when we got there, we had been in a river, so we were soaked. So um, the guard helped me change into like these clothes that they gave me that did not make me look tough or cool at all. So I tried to make up for it with like a swagger. Total failure. Um, and I made friends in there. I, there was actually a guy in holding. There was a little window he could see me through, and I was getting prints done, and he started doing one of these. I was like, he likes me. Oh. <laughs> This is nice. Think of the how we met story here. <laughs> but I started talking to, I was there long enough that I was trying to figure out, you know, like, how do you, do you call a bail bondsman? Like, how will my crew know I'm here? And if you only have numbers on your cell phone and they give you one call, guess what? You won't know anybody's phone number. So memorize one phone number. That's one tip for you. Um, so eventually our crew figured out where we were. But in the interim, I had made friends with a bunch of people in holding because um, what else are you going to do? 
And I found out that, you know, I always thought like, well, people, you know, someone can make one bad decision and end up in jail, and that was my case. Um, but in these people's cases, it was many, many, many bad decisions that led them to this life in and out of jail that was like a habitual, it was now their lifestyle was, was jail. And I found out that there was like a, a number of decisions, like there would be one bad decision, and then there would be a second, and then there would be a third, and then it was like they had so much momentum in the direction of like overdraft notices and neck tattoos and, and jail and bad friends and drugs, and it just goes and goes and goes and goes. Because I'd listen to their stories and they would say one thing, like, well, I, I wanted to see what meth was like, so I wanted to try it. And I'd think, mm -hmm, it's not the best choice, but okay, it's, it's one bad. And then I, I needed it, so I started selling it. Ooh, yeah, that's, that's not so good. And then the third and fourth and fifth decision, and then you realize they don't even know they're making bad decisions anymore. It's just the momentum. They're just like in, they're always in the wrong place at the wrong time, because that's just where they live anymore. And it got me thinking about just that one decision, you know, like that one decision to where I decided I'm going to be a mechanical engineer or the one decision to buy a house at a good mortgage rate or just that one small good decision that leads you rolling down this path of success and glamour and decisiveness and courage, that it can be that small and, and that you can afford one misstep Okay, I have a mugshot now. I was in jail for nine hours, but we got it all figured out. I'm never, ever going back to jail because I had so much momentum already in this really productive direction. You know, I was already, already had a degree, already had this TV show, already had a career, was already working on a book deal. So for me, that was just a weird detour. Are you going to stay out of jail? do because I can tell you the mug shots are so terrible. You will look so awful. There's not, and I didn't, I didn't bring it. I was going to, but it is honestly just terrifying. And I tried too. I tried to kind of like turn my shoulders a little bit and like flex my cheekbones just tiniest bit. And I still looked just terrifying. So those are my models of the world in my physics and chemistry brain. And that's how I believe you can become more decisive and courageous and glamorous if you understand physics. And one of the things, really one of the best, best decisions I've ever, ever made, and I almost can't believe I made this decision at 17 years old, it, is to become a mechanical engineer. And I did it because I wanted to be taken seriously, and I did it because I grew up on welfare, I grew up with a single disabled mom, I grew up without nice things. Sometimes we couldn't turn the heat on, and I grew up in Anchorage, so that was a big deal. Sometimes we didn't have food. Sometimes we would, you know, borrow eggs from the neighbors and say we were making cookies when really that was dinner. So I was determined that that was not going to be my future, that I was going to do something that made me essential in the world, that I could build power plants and hospitals and that people would look to me for real decisions and pay me real money to make those decisions. So um, that's why I did it. And if you aren't sure about what you want to do, please consider mechanical, electrical, civil, engineering, any of the engineerings, but those are my favorites. And I've been able to um, do other things, obviously, write songs and be in a band. I was in a band in college and it helped me uh, pay for college, partly. Um, and I noticed that I use the same kind of parts of my brain. Like building a song is very much like um, building a structure or working on a project where you have, where the, you can take the verse and chorus and bridge and you can kind of move them around in different ways, just like you can the structure or the rooms of a building or an HVAC system. So you can do more than one thing. You can do more than two things. You can have 10 jobs in your lifetime and, and create a pretty amazing life for yourself with just, although you referred to me as a doctor, thank you, I only have a four-year degree, <laughs> with just a four-year degree. So consider that, and I'm gonna play you um, a song, and then if you have any questions, let me know. This is the book.
and I just got a second, just signed a contract for a second book deal. Um, this one's about physics, and the second one is going to be specifically about engineering and about how I learned it in college and, and why I did it. Because now I've become sort of the spokesperson for women engineers, because there aren't many of us, apparently. I didn't realize that was still going to be the case um, when I'm, now that I'm 50 years old, but that is still the case. I'm mostly still the only woman in the room during meetings, which is not such a bad thing. You'll, get, you'll be remembered. If you're, the, if you're the weird one in the room, whatever you say will be remembered. So um, that can be good and bad. You know, If you have a bad day and you say something really silly, that's tough because they will remember it for years to come. One of the nice things, too, about being a musician is that I can express things in songs that I can't really at work. You know, at work, I need to keep my cool. Um, but sometimes I get angry at people, and then I just write little revenge songs about them. <laughs> and I'm in a band with two of my very best friends, two women I've been playing music with for probably 12 years now. And it is just an absolute blast. So this song, uh, I'll never play for the person I wrote it for. Um, there's a fellow who had been, I started in my own business in August, and there's a fellow from a really large company who'd been very helpful about um, how to, how to um, propose to universities and how to propose to hospitals um, work on projects. And um, uh, I, I just won a project for Portland State University. I'm going to help um, build their athletic center. And it's just, I just have a small piece of the project, but still it, was, it felt like a really big win for me and I was very excited. And there was about 15 companies who'd competed for it and, and uh, I got it and all the companies who'd competed for it were sent the announcement saying, okay, uh, Christine McKinley's whole building solution got it. And I got an email from this guy and he said, yeah, they mostly give those projects to women and minorities. Yeah. <laughs> I thought of all these really nasty things to say to him, but I just never responded. It's better just let him think about what he said. <laughs> I was your charity And now you want me To go away Oh, but you know me, I'm gonna stay. If I hit the ground and I hail the friendly fire, I'm just down crawling under your trip wire. I'm not down, 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 down. This is fun for me to turn your script into confetti you think you're almost done with me I'm done with you already if I hit the ground in a hail of friendly fire I'm just down crawling under your trip wire I'm not For the same side, you're still taking shots when even the parades have died. If I hit the ground and I hail a friendly fire, I'm just down crawling under your trip wire. I'm not. what I started I'm about to finish you you've been outsmarted you've been outsmarted
Thank you. It's so satisfying. That poor man has no idea that I'm playing a song about him. And with that, we'll go ahead and, and start taking questions. Who's going to be an engineer here? I just want to... Nice, 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 nice. Yeah. Come on now. He's going like this. Well, maybe. Maybe. It's okay. That's fair. Any questions about engineering, about being the only woman in the room, about... Hello. Hi. I enjoyed your lecture, by the way. Thank I'm a you. voices writer for the Reading Eagle. Oh, hi. I was wondering what inspired you to write your book. I read your book and I enjoyed your book a oh, lot. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Um, you know, what inspired me is I have uh, a lot of really, really um, smart friends who are musicians and artists and um, writers who um, don't know what an electron is or don't really know what a shooting star is. Or, you know, one of them caught, one of them said, isn't that weird, like, when there's a shooting star that there's, like, one less star in the world? Like, oh, my God. So what I wanted was for those really smart, curious, creative people to have a way in to physics, to have a way in to see um, the laws of motion and energy like I do and see them as these sort of personal, these inside jokes and these friends. And thankfully, they've, they've read it and enjoy it. I, it's basically because I wanted to be able to have nerdy conversations on road trips that no one was able to, to join in. <laughs> and I found out that they were really curious. When I'd start talking about physics to non-engineer, non-physics -phys people, they really perked up and went, wait, an electron is a, is a wave and a particle? How, how, what? Yeah, that's real. I didn't make that up. Any other questions? Song requests? No, just kidding. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know, here's what I've heard from teachers, is that um, if, if it will help them with a goal they already have, then they're more likely to invite you into the classroom. So if, if there, do you guys do standardized testing? Does everyone do standard, in grade schools? <laughs> so if it helps them with that goal, they're more likely to give up class time. I mean, that's just what I've heard as I've sort of been a volunteer in other people's programs, but otherwise it's just so hard for them to carve out that time. So if you, if you said, okay, well, tell me what you're, tell me what you're, is it, a, what, what are you doing a unit on? Are you doing a unit on generators, volcanoes, or whatever will help you with that particular unit? That's the only way in that I can see, but I'm not, I'm not a teacher, so I don't know. Hi. Um, uh, for for people who aren't great at um, standing up and speaking, um, what what's the best way to, um, I guess, I Im improve to get better at that standing up and well, speaking? No, no. To to improve, um, you know, like you, like you were saying about how like being scientifically literate improves the way you look at things. Like, what would be a good way to promote scientific literacy? if not by getting up and telling people directly. Oh, if you're not necessarily a presenter, how do you help with scientific literacy? Well, I, there is a great need for um, writers and reporters who understand science and can translate that. I mean, and being a writer is very private and solitary. Um, there's a, certainly a great need for that. Um, so you wouldn't want to necessarily be a teacher you know, I, I've just been surprised at how conversations between my, f with my friends who didn't think they were scientific, just conversations with people who don't think it's their thing, how you can kind of make it their thing just among your own circle, too. 
But there's a great uh, writer, what's her name? Natalie Angers, she, run, she won a Pulitzer Prize, I think she writes for New York Times. She wrote a book called um, The Canon, C-A-N-O-N. And she just takes, she goes through physics and chemistry and biology and she's a really funny, clever writer and um, I've never seen her do any sort of shows or any commentary on TV or anything. She's done really well. Yes. Um, along the same lines as the mother of the person who just spoke, um, there's a book that was out recently, I don't know the name of it, talking about the value of the quiet one and the introvert in groups. Where do you see that in engineering? Can you describe that a little bit for me? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, in, I work with usually teams that are about six to eight people when it comes right down to I don't know why that's the magic number, but that seems to be where it lands a lot. And there is always, you know, the person that, the quiet one that is still calculating something long after the rest of us have decided that we think we know the answer and that we're gonna, you know, we're gonna route the waste in this way and do these trenches. And I know, I know this guy's name, in fact, John Walters is the, the guy that, that I now work with him and he's out on his own as well. And he will, he will fuss over something quietly for hours after the rest of us have stopped thinking about it. He'll take it home with him, and he, he gets up at 4.30 in the morning, so annoying, and he'll be on the job site by 6.30 and come in and say, hey, I thought of a, a solution for that, and it's something that none of us thought of because he just stuck with the problem longer. So I, I believe the, if you don't have a person like that on your team, when that happens to me, I get nervous. I want to have at least one of those quiet thinkers that says, yeah, you guys are going off in this direction, but I think I have a different solution. So a lot of, a lot of brilliance comes out of that, that quiet person. Hi. Considering the mess that we have in Congress, it would seem that none of them ever took a course in science. <laughs> would, would you consider? <laughs> I know. Would you consider running for Congress, and per <laughs> perhaps having an influence so they would understand the rules of the way the planet behaves? Wouldn't that be nice? I would love to just do a little little breakfast class for them, but I couldn't run for Congress because um, the smear campaign would just be horrific. Yeah, I have way too many, way too many skeletons. But yeah, I, I, I agree. It's it's like just like on television when they would say, here's your expert on comets or something, and it would just be this cuckoo, that person that had no idea. And then thank God we you know we'd go over to the, you know, as, as the astronomy department at UCLA and we would talk to someone who made sense. But sometimes the people who call themselves experts are just the loudest. They're, they don't really know what they're saying. But it, it astonishes me too that the level of scientific literacy is so low, the bar is so low um, for, for people who are in charge. That's why I would love to see, see people take physics and chemistry and biology, even if they are, are gonna go and be a novelist or they're gonna go and be a dancer, just to know because this is, these are decisions we're all making together and we have to weigh in on together. Yes? Yeah, <laughs> sorry. The biggest, the biggest challenge of being a noble gas, um, I think, is what other people think of me. You know that that they find a sing, you know, the spinster thing. I am officially a spinster, and that that's a little bit um, pitiable to some people. Like, oh, you don't have a husband, or you don't have kids, and I think, yeah, that's right. Oh, you're feeling sorry for me. Oh, okay, sorry. This is a weird conversation. So I think just being understood. You know, like I don't, I don't want the same kinds of connection as other people do. I like this kind of connection. I love my brilliant friends, um, but I, you know, if you invite me to a baby shower, I'm probably going to send a nice gift. Just bow out of it. Even weddings now, I just send a gift. So I think it's just being it, like anyone. It's just being under understood, and that there are certain things that you don't need them to feel sorry for you. Okay, we have one here in the back. 
Um, so I understand uh, you're a strong supporter of the STEM and everything that it's about, but um, seeing as you're also a musician, where do you feel that the arts stand in um, that whole plethora? I think that um, arts are fantastic training for engineers and for scientists, um, because a lot of times it's the solutions that you would never have thought of um, that become the, the solutions that are most workable. So I think the, the engineers who know how to be creative and the scientists who know how to be creative and how to encourage those happy accidents that happen, with, whether you're recording a song or figuring out the size of a solvent waste tank, the people that know how to grab onto those um, just do much better. I mean, Einstein was terribly creative. He really knew how to go with the flow of an idea and just sort of follow where it went rather than try and decide what the the solution was. So I think if you can, if you have training playing an instrument early on, painting and drawing, all of those things work, your, you know, exercise your brain in a way that you will certainly use later. Absolutely no doubt about that. My question is related to the previous question. I was wondering if you incorporate your musician skills to um, help students remember things better from your lectures or your talks when you go into the schools. Right, you know what, I haven't, but I have seen some brilliant teachers, um, two of them now that have used Lady Gaga, or no, Beyonce and Lady Gaga, where they've used lyrics and tried to, and just made them into little um, songs that helped their algebra students or calculus students. I don't, because I'm not a teacher, I haven't really thought about it much. I still remember the ones I made up in high school for, um, trigonometry and for to remember certain things. I made up weird little songs that I absolutely will not share with you because they're so weird. So I've done it for myself and I think it's wonderful when, when teachers do it. It's so smart. We have one more question. Okay. Um, to me, uh, kind of going back to your earlier life, you mentioned how you signed up for the chem class and you had to go over to the boys building mm -hmm. and coming back to your more current life you were saying how the um you, you're a boss i was that the relation or um i don't know the the uh engineer man you were talking about who said oh they only give that position yeah. to women, women and, minorities. and yeah. uh, minorities so it sounds like Overall, we still have this mentality we have to invite women into the men's world. How are we going to influence society to get it through our heads yeah. that everyone is equally capable? You know, I think that's a great question. I think the way you do it is by being equally capable. You know, by showing up and getting in the trenches with the guys. And I mean, I've had the weirdest conversation with guys on site. I was helping build a cogen power plant in the middle of nowhere in Eastern Washington. And everyone, it was freezing cold, it was snowing, and, and everyone was just toughing it out. And I was with this mechanical subcontractor and we were unloading a bunch of valves from this truck. And you know, to me, I'm thinking, we're just all in here in the trenches doing it together. And I said, well, those are the, those are the globe valve and these are the butterfly valve, so make sure we don't want to mix them. And he goes, he stopped and said, you know the difference between a globe and a butterfly valve? I said, I'm a mechanical engineer. In the middle, you know, of the snowstorm. Really? You're a mechanical engineer? So by the end, you know, months after that, while we were all sort of leaving the site at different times as our jobs were ending, he pulled me aside and said, you changed my mind. You're the first woman engineer I've met who I respected, and now I feel differently. I was like, now I wonder how many people have, I've done that with, but they didn't bother to say it, but this guy just kind of had the whatever, I don't know, he maybe was, it was his way of apologizing. You know, saying now, now I won't think that anymore. So it's, it's still happening. And, and then surprisingly, there are some, you know, I'll, I'll meet like an older guy and think like, oh, he's gonna be really biased. Sometimes it's not them, sometimes it's the younger guys. So, like I, I, I will sometimes reverse bias and think that I've got to be careful because someone's like from a certain state or a certain age and they're not at all like that. So I think the only way you can do it is just, just do a great job and pretend like it's not happening. And then when it happens blatantly, just I've gone to people, no, you can't say something like that and then just continue with my job because I didn't want to make it any bigger a deal than that. But no, you're not going to be able to do that. I don't know how else to 
but I'm not a woman's studies major or an educator, or, and I didn't think that being an, uh, an engineer would be a revolutionary act, but apparently it is. So I, I'm just as confused as you are sometimes. Okay, well, let's go ahead and thank our thank speaker you. again. Thank you. And uh, for those interested, we will have actually a book signing right outside in the lobby here for, the, for around 20 minutes or so. So if anyone's interested, we'll, we'll have that. And other than that, uh, thank you again for coming. And we look forward to uh, seeing you at the 32nd uh, annual Brosman Frisbee Lectureship. Thank you.